to be chairing the meeting here this evening. Tonight we're joined, uh, we're joining in a celebration of people power, hope and solidarity in Bolivia. We're looking back on their historic victory against the coup regime and looking forward to the challenges ahead because as we know, comrades, there are always challenges. This meeting has been organized by the Friends of Bolivia and Labour Friends of Progressive Latin America. Uh, and as well as the Zoom call, uh, we're also streaming live to Facebook, to Twitter and to YouTube. Now, as many of you on this call know, six months ago, the movement towards socialism won an historic election victory in, in Bolivia, in Bolivia's presidential election, kicking out the military led coup regime that had ousted President Evo Morales in November 2019. Throughout its 11 month duration, that illegitimate coup regime led by Janine Agnes was characterized by widespread repression, corruption and incompetence. We saw systematic political and judicial persecution against the MAS, its leaders and its activists, brutal repression against the social movements associated with it and racist violence unleashed against indigenous peoples, including massacres in Sakaba and Senkata. But despite this savage repression, in the midst of the pandemic, heroic resistance against the regime continued, buoyed by international solidarity by all of you on this call this evening and challenging the mainstream media narrative that this was not a coup. With that stunning election victory by 55% to the nearest challenger on 28%, the new government led by, uh, by President Luis Arce has begun to make, make good on his inauguration promise to rebuild Bolivia, kickstarting the economy by increasing people's spending power and with public investment. Arce has also instituted a three-pronged strategy to tackle COVID the COVID-19 pandemic and is rebuilding the links with allies and partners that the coup regime had dismantled. President Assa has also moved quickly to, top, to make top level changes in the armed forces and to begin the process of holding to account those who committed human rights abuses and other serious crimes during the coup regime. Tonight, we're going to be hearing from Bolivian activists and international guests as we give our solidarity and support to the continued struggle in Bolivia. So first, it's my uh, it's my uh, my pleasure to introduce Miriam Kolke. We're going to hear from her. She is a Bolivian activist living in London who has campaigned extensively against the coup, representing Bartolina Sisa resistance, whose watchwords are dignity, freedom, and sovereignty. Welcome, sister. We're delighted to hear from you. The floor is yours. Unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, everybody, for inviting me. Um, I am an activist, a Bolivian activist living in London, but also I am a community advocate for the migrants and refugees, uh, as well as a spokesperson for the uh, Barcelona Social Resistance a grassroots organization that was created immediately after the 2019 coup. And from day one, we've been denouncing the fascist regime in Bolivia. We resisted, we fought, and we won, but the struggle continues. Firstly, it's important to talk about what provoked the imperialist aggressions of the West, which was Evo Morales coming to power. After more than 500 years of resistance, we asked ourselves, why did, what did our ancestors not have the opportunity to study because before 1952, it was forbidden for native people to get education. The Europeans cut off hands, pounds, and much more. Only the white men had the right to study and attend university. We lived in a racist Republican state and rebellions were constant. Our history is full of indigenous people and mining workers massacres. And these have continued to the present, from right-wing coup sponsored by the empire to plunder our natural resources. On December 2005, the native indigenous and peasant organizations headed by 
Comrade Evo Morales and many others created the political instrument for people's sovereignty, the mass IPSP, the historic triumph of the first indigenous president would mark a new stage that spun 14 years of the most important transformations in Bolivia. In 2006, there was the historic nationalization of natural resources which helped to fund social projects and the creation of industrialization of strategic companies. With Evo, there was democratic and cultural revolution. On February the 7th, 2009, we had a new constitution recognizing French Clooney, the plurinational state of Bolivia was born. The role of women has also become visible, in particular of indigenous women, although it is necessary to open more political and decision-making for women and their equal element, all the far right got together. In particular, individuals like Fernando Camacho, who led the coup in order to save his company. Retired army officers supported the coup and trained paramilitary groups. On November the 6th, 2019, days before the coup during the peaceful mobilization in Cochabamba, indigenous women were brutally attacked by paramilitary groups, including the now Consolidate the coup. His boss, Jose Aramayo, was flogged, tied to a tree. But Francisco Molares was another victim. Other foreign journalists were present and forced to leave the country. Nearly 100 community radios were destroyed, and thus media barriers were imposed, misinforming the population. In Bolivia, some of the press and media are financed by the NED and actively participated in the coup. Janine Agnes took power in with her racist thieves, arsonists, torturers, murderers, and paramilitaries allied to the police. They defied constitutional due process. The persecution against mass authorities, social leaders, militants was ruthless. Your brown indigenous skin or blue clothing defined your destiny. With decree 4078, and gave the military and police consent to assassinate. The massacre in Sacaba, Sencata, El Pedregal, Rosales, Yapacani, the Kansas, leaving 37 dead, more than 800 injured, and more than 1,500 prisoners tortured. The regime planted false evidences and accuses, accused all of sedition and terrorism. Militarization took place in the middle of the pandemic. People were forced into a rigid quarantine and abandoned by the, the regime without food and no medical attention, while the corruption of the coup plot reached 400%. In less than a year, everything was destroyed and stolen. They had, they had a clear intention of handing over our natural resources to transnational, bankrupting our state company. The US interest in Bolivia geopolitically is important as well as for the UK. Camacho with the civic committee put his cronies in public positions, paramilitaries like the Cochala Justice System attended meetings to elect municipal councillors, invalidating nomination of mass members. In August 2020, the Bolivian people mobilized and managed to secure an election date and victory of Lucho and David. People had enough, despite the difficulties, we have regained political stability. First measures were introduced to combat COVID, economy was reactivated, and they returned the IMF fund. Education was reopened, the culture ministry reinstated, taxes for the rich were approved, large extensions of land that Branco Marinkovic wanted to take over were reversed. Back in January, the relatives of the Sincata and Pedregal victims reached an agreement with the government to receive financial compensation and jobs and many more. And here is a fact worth highlighting. 
with the same courage of our heroine, Bartolina Sisa, a brave indigenous woman, former congresswoman, Lydia Patti, start, started a judicial process against the coup plotters. Thus, Janine Agnes is in trial detention now. So the coup is not a revenge, it's not a political persecution, it is justice and reparation. From here, we send to Sister Patti our solidarity greetings and all our support. Women also came out to fight for democracy, but we still live in a patriarchal society. We have a majority of women representation in the Senate, yet femicide increases. Today, there are more than 32 women murdered, and the judicial system at times does not respond on time. We need a judicial reform and transparency. I'm certain that True. Miriam, I, we've we've had a little difficulty oh, with your we've, we've had a little difficulty with your audio and it's cutting out. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you there because we were having difficulty following. But we we had most of what you said, and in particular, it's important that we offer solidarity to the women who always step forward in these conditions, but who also always yeah. find themselves under tremendous pressure. Miriam, thank you very much for that contribution. Thank you. And I'm now going to, uh, I'm now going to move to our, uh, our second speaker. Our second speaker is, is Oli Vargas. Um, he is a Bolivia-based journalist, reporting and writing direct from Bolivia, uh, providing news and political uh, analysis from Latin America and Bolivia in particular. He contributes to, uh, all of the, uh, the best publications and broadcast media, Telesur, Morning Star, The Grey Zone, Mint Press News, and other media outlets. And he presents a daily show on Bolivian radio uh, focused on supporting Bolivia's social movements. Oli, you're very welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you um, to everyone who's joined this call. Thank you especially to the organizers, uh, Friends of Bolivia, Friends of Latin uh, progressive friends of, Latin, of progressive Latin America, and I think the 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 the, me, the reason for having this event is incredibly important to analyse what has happened since the defeat of the coup in October uh, of of last year. And I think in 2019 there was a huge spike in interest in Bolivia at an international level. People were pulled at the images of the indigenous Wipala flag being burnt in the streets. People were pulled at the images of massacres, two separate massacres taking place within 10 days of the new right-wing government taking power. Um, people were dismayed at, at the bare facts of Bolivia's economic collapse once the economic powerhouse of the region and suddenly uh, with the economy on the floor after just a few months of neoliberal reforms, free market measures that were introduced just after the coup. But I was worried at the time that, you know, maybe people enjoy the images of uh, people rising up, people protesting, uh, people on, you know, holding a general strike, but the people might lose interest afterwards. And I found that actually that's not been the case. People are incredibly interested about the Bolivian experience and about how a country rebuilds after being through such a, a horrifying period like the one Bolivia went through. And I think Bolivia is now uh, something of an example of a model that other countries can look to and to see you know, what works, what doesn't, but there's a lot to learn from. And then the most important area is the area of the economy. Now, under Agnes, the econ unemployment tripled after just a few months of her taking power. When the pandemic hit, she declared a total quarantine, but without providing any uh, income support to the people who had suddenly lost their incomes. And, you know, in a country in which the majority of people work in the informal economy, it was the large majority. In a recent in a survey done at the time, only 8% of Bolivians said that they hadn't lost all or part of their income under the quarantine measures. 92% had been affected in that way. But Luis Arce takes power. Who is Luis Arce? Luis Arce 
is uh, was Bolivia's economy minister under President Evo Morales for almost that whole period, whole presidency. And he's he's an expert economist. He's a socialist, and he came into the left after building a Marxist study uh, circle and Marxist study circle around the study of economics, specifically focused on the issue of what does a post neoliberal economy look like? Economy beyond free markets and globalization. And so he went from being economy minister and is now the president and has gone about rebuilding Bolivia's old economic model that he built together with Evo Morales in uh, starting in 2005, going on for 13 years. That economic model turned Bolivia from one of the poorest countries in the region into the fastest growing economy in South America. So what does the economic reconstruction of Bolivia consist of? Well, firstly, it consists of reactivating the state industries that were closed down under the Anya's regime. After the coup took place, the main ideological goal of the new regime, other than excluding the indigenous majority from power, was to destroy the socialist economic model built under Morales and to institute or to shrink the size of the state in the economy. What we say in the past few months is that various state, pro, various state companies in transport, in manufacturing, have now been reopened. Just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Latin America's largest glass factory, making glass bottles, which is located in Chuquisaca, in Bolivia, was reopened. It was built in 2019 under Evo Morales and then closed under the Añez regime as part of their free market uh, reforms. It is now being reopened. Thousands of people now have their job back and Bolivia will now produce its own glass bottles rather than importing them, something that is a huge boost to the economy. There's also uh, a state factory built for processing acai. Now, some of you may know acai is uh, this Amazonian berry that's become a sort of hipster food in, in the United States and Europe is very expensive. And the, the normal trade relations for, for, for this berry is that Western, Western corporations in Europe or the US go to countries like Brazil and Bolivia, buy up the berries as the real thing, take it back to their factories and process it there to produce the goods that people buy. So what Bolivia is doing is now building a factory to do all the processing within the country and sell it, export it at that value added price. And all of that is done within a state owned factory. And what happens with, this, with the profits of those sales, those go to the state, which can then be used in infrastructure to build hospitals uh, and so forth. So this is a key, key part of the economic reconstruction that's taking place in Bolivia, because the whole the most important thing about Bolivia's successful economic model is that a country cannot uh, earn what it needs to simply by taxing the rich. You, you need to have the nationalization or the state creation of profitable industries that are under the control of the public and whose profits can be used for developing for poverty reduction and for all the social spending that a country needs. That's the only way that a country can have control of its destiny, the only way that a country can achieve things such as self-sufficiency, food sovereignty, food security, which is another important uh, point which has improved enormously since the mass uh, restored democracy in Bolivia. Uh, under the Anya's government, you know, the, the most common and well-known theme of the past year was racism, discrimination against the country's indigenous majority. Uh, many of whom are rural workers uh, in the provinces. There, you know, people couldn't take their goods to market during lockdown. Agricultural production virtually collapsed. But now what they're doing, they've revived the government agency for food sovereignty. And now they're investing in those indigenous rural communities, providing tools, technical advice, so that Bolivia can produce all of the goods that it consumes, all of the foods that it consumes. And that way Bolivia is not subject to fluctuations in the international market or attacks, sanctions by the countries such as the United States. So these, this is how Bolivia is rebuilding after 
neoliberal chaos last year, which saw the worst economic collapse for many years. But these measures, of course, put it on a collision course with the United States, particularly Bolivia's decision to obtain justice for the people who were massacred after the coup in El Alto in Sacaba, Cochabamba. When Bolivia's government arrested, when the police arrested the former dictator Hernán Añez, the United States, Joe Biden's Secretary of State, Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, says that this is political persecution, this is authoritarianism in Bolivia, and called for Añez's release. Someone who ordered the executions of over 30 people across the country. Someone who's not facing charges just for those killings, but also for uh, proven corruption, also for taking out an illegal IMF loan, because in Bolivia, any taking out these types of loans requires a vote in parliament that wasn't taken. And Anya is indebted to the indebted the country to the tune of over 300 million on exorbitant interest rates, something that the mass returned. They said to the IMF, we don't want anything to do with you. They returned the sum in full, even with the economic loss that was the interest payments generated by Agnes. All of this has put Bolivia on that collision course with the United States. So it, we can expect to see more of that discourse coming from the White House, talking about Bolivia has become authoritarian, Bolivia is uh, taking vengeance, and it's cracking down on its opposition, as the Washington Post said. When, but where were these institutions when Bolivians were being executed in the streets, when people were going to a protest would be shot in the leg and paralyzed for the rest of their lives? When hundreds and hundreds of people were... Where were those voices then? The arrests that have taken place over the past year have been in the pursuit of justice. How can these massacres go uh, without any kind of recognition, without any kind of uh, punishment? Because if you have impunity today, what you'll have is another coup, more massacres tomorrow. That's what the United States is looking for, impunity for its actors that were funded from Washington. And something that's not mentioned ever in these international uh, media outlets that condemn Bolivia for trying to get justice for those massacred is that Henny and Agnes is one of the only people that's been arrested for the crimes of last year. The demand of victims' families and of the majority of people in Bolivia is that those arrests should be much more extensive. Just last week, we had the Minister of the Presidency, which is the highest ranking minister, uh, Marianela Prada. She came here to visit the families of those who were massacred in Guayani, Sacaba. And I was there filming people wailing in tears, begging for justice. They said, this is not enough. It's not just Agnes who was involved. The other people were involved, Carlos Mesa, Fernando Camacho. What about the police officers? What about the military officers? Carrying out crimes of this scale require a huge criminal network. Mm. And why haven't those people been arrested? That's the demand of the people, of the victims. And, and it's those voices that are never listened to on an international level. So I hope that through events like these, we can try to communicate that to the world. Because those are voices that the international media will never give coverage to. And that's why we set up uh, Calcetra News in an attempt to do that. We set up as a project of Radio Calcetra and Coca, which, was the, which is the radio station owned by the six federations of the Tropic of Cochabamba, the union once led by Evo Morales. And when the coup happened and the mass, mass arrest persecution happened in the cities, our radio was the only one left standing because it's in this region, in the Tropic of Cochabamba, the bastion of the revolution in Bolivia, in which the entire community mobilized to defend the radio. We were leaked last year, we were leaked audio recordings from the Ministry of Communication in which they were discussing how the military can take over our offices. The, at the end of the meeting, they decided not to follow through because they thought if they intervene, how would they know if they'll come out alive? So it was that, that level of organization, community organization on the ground, that ensured the recuperation of democracy in Bolivia. And I hope that can be, hope people 
listen to the voices of that majority who voted to restore democracy and not just give column inches to the tiny minority who went out and protested against Evan Morales in 2019. He went out and burnt the indigenous with pile of flag in 2019. The None of this is going to be easy. Rebuilding the economy after such destruction, after the shock therapy of last year, is not going to be easy. But it's been done once before. In 2005, after Carlos Mesa being president and they tried to privatise natural gas, the economy was completely collapsed. 67% of Bolivians lived below the poverty line. But they didn't complain. Luis Alves and Eva Morales, they didn't say, oh, look at the state that we've been left. Look at what, you know, look at the country that we've been left. They got to work, they built an economic model based on the nationalization of strategic industries and using those profits to invest in poverty reduction. And that turned Bolivia into the fastest growing economy in the region. And that's what they're gonna to have to do now. On that, on Make that very deal. positive note, I'm gonna ask you to wind up, Oli, because that was fantastic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's all. Thanks for listening to me, everyone. And uh, uh, follow us on such news for more information. And make sure that we we'll make sure that we actually do. Uh, try and amplify those voices, the ones that you are amplifying through your radio station. Thank you so much, uh, Ollie. Okay, our next our next speaker is um, is Alex Main. Uh, Alex uh, is uh, is a US based director of international policy at the Center for Economic and Policy Research. He's joining us from Arizona. That's one of the wonders of Zoom that we can actually have people from Bolivia and also from Arizona. Alex monitors economic and political developments in Latin America and the Caribbean, including the impact of US relations with Bolivia, Brazil, Ecuador, Honduras, and, and of course, Venezuela. And crucially, the CEPR debunked the false claims of fraud produced by the Organization of American States to spur on the far right coup. Alex, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Christine, and uh, thanks very much to uh, the Friends of Bolivia and Labor Friends of Progressive Latin America, and, um, and also to my excellent uh, co-panelists, uh, Miriam and Ollie. Uh, so yeah, as Christine mentioned, I'm in Arizona at the moment. Um, we have really shoddy um, internet infrastructure here, so I'm hoping uh, that we have a clear signal for the next uh, you know, eight, ten minutes, um, but I can't uh, absolutely guarantee it. Um, so, uh, yeah, as was mentioned, I'm at the Center for Economic and Policy Research that's based in Washington, D.C., uh, and as our name suggests, we do a lot of work on economic policy um, around the world, really, but we also do a lot on U.S. Uh, foreign policy, and specifically in Latin America, and we've done a lot of work on Bolivia. Um, I invite everyone to have a look at our webpage, www cepr.net. Don't get us confused with the uh, more neoliberal uh, economic think tank um, of the same name, but that ends with .org or .net. Uh, and you can find a lot there on Bolivia. Um, we've done a lot of papers on uh, Bolivia's social and economic policies, particularly under uh, Evo Morales. Um, and as was just mentioned, a lot on the elections in Bolivia and on the um, fake uh, claims of fraud that uh, the OAS promoted, and you know, which uh, played a big role, obviously, in the coup that took place in, in late 2019. So um, I've been asked to focus on, on U.S. policy towards Bolivia, or uh, as, as Ali put it, Bolivia's U.S. Bolivia's collision course with the U.S. Um, and indeed, uh, you know, uh, the U.S government has been really very hostile to Mass and Evo um, from the very beginning and has intervened in all sorts of ways to prevent the Mass political project from advancing. Um, so ultimately, even after supporting the 2019 coup, they have failed to keep uh, Mass down, uh, but it does not appear that they're going to stop trying. Um, and really, it, it's as soon as Mass began to emerge as sort of a more serious, um, you know, strong political force in the end, the end of the 90s, early 2000s, uh, the U.S. Um, sort of began its offensive, uh, you know, and we immediately saw in the early 2000s, before the 2002 election, the ambassadors, first Manuel Rocha and then David Greenlee, the U.S. ambassadors, publicly attacking Morales and Mas, threatening to cut off aid to Bolivia 
um, you know, if the mass won. Um, and, and ironically, this just added to the popularity of Evo Morales and the mass and, and helped them, I think, uh, achieve some big gains uh, for the mass in the 2002 elections. And we've learned a lot about what uh, the U.S. Um, was up to during those early years of mass, uh, thanks to the investigative work of Jeremy Bigwood, um, and also, of course, the trove of uh, uh, leaked diplomatic cables uh, that were released by WikiLeaks uh, some years ago. Um, so as, as mass you know, took off uh, during the early 2000s, the U.S. Um, uh, kicked its uh, democracy promotion machine into gear and millions of dollars were poured into all sorts of anti-mass projects that were supported by you know, the US um, development, uh, so-called development agency, USAID. Um, in 2002, for instance, uh, USAID uh, funded uh, a political party reform project that um, was design designed explicitly, you know, in sort of the internal memos to serve as a counterweight to the radical mass. And, and really we saw a pattern in Bolivia that we've seen throughout the region where the left has sort of risen up with millions of dollars of US assistance channeled to NGOs and business groups that are aligned with uh, the US and local elites. And these NGOs uh, often with very close connections to right-wing parties um, are promoted as the you know, legitimate representatives of civil society, quote unquote, um, and you know, sort of promoted as the voices of opposition to mass and in the media and internationally. And in contrast, the vast uh, grassroots social movements of campesinos, trade unions, uh, indigenous groups that support the mass are just ignored, dismissed. And when they're not dis ignored and dismissed, they're stigmatized. And that, of course, was the case of the Cocalero movement um, that formed the original base of the mass, the, you know, the coca farmers, uh, who were portrayed as narco-terrorists. And of course, this representation was relayed in a lot of the media. But all of the U.S. efforts to marginalize the mass completely backfired. And of course, in 2005, Evo was elected president in a landslide, and mass ended up with a big majority of seats in the Bolivian Congress. And um, as a result, U.S. interference intensified, and uh, you know the U.S. aggressively opposed. And this we've seen, you know, in some of the WikiLeaks cables that have been released. Uh, they opposed the mass's policy. Um, you know, of allowing um, the farming of coca for traditional purposes. Um, for them, the only acceptable policy was er eradication and criminalization, you know. And they also uh, opposed the masses' plans to nationalize the hydrocarbon sector and the masses' plans for constituent assembly. And uh, the U.S. Am am ambassador at the time, David Greenlee, had a whole plan to oppose these things by blocking funding to um, Bolivia from, you know, uh, multilateral uh, development organizations by uh, putting off um, the debt cancellation that had been promised uh, to Bolivia, um, threatening to suspend trade benefits and, and so on. But of course, Evo Morales and Mas did not care. They forged ahead with their program um, which included, you know, state intervention in the economy, um, anti-poverty measures, national control um, over natural resources, and they achieved, you know, the renationalization of the hydrocarbon sector, um, and the redistribution of the revenue revenue from these natural resources, um, you know, to those that most needed it in Bolivia, and and of course at the time the respectable mainstream commentators in the Financial Times, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and so on, were scoffing at these unorthodox measures and they predicted catastrophe, but things actually turned out very well for Bolivia. Um, and during the Evo administration from 2006 to 2019, Bolivia experienced one of the highest rates of growth in uh, Latin America. Poverty fell from 60% uh, to 35%. Extreme poverty fell from uh, nearly 40% to 15%. And, uh, and of course, the nationalization of the hydrocarbon sector, which the, the US government 
tried to prevent was you know, really central to all of this economic and social progress. Uh, we have a whole paper discussing this um, from October 2019 called Bolivia's Economic Transformation that you can look up. Um, and on the foreign policy front, uh, Bolivia uh, played a very big role in promoting Latin American independence and integration with you know, these new regional organizations like UNASUR for South America, um, which really began to take form um, in Bolivia and Cochabamba in 2006 uh, at uh, South American summit there. And then you know, the ALBA um, group of countries you know, with Venezuela and Cuba and other countries um, that worked to you know, supplant the Washington-based and Washington-aligned Organization of American States um, you know, as sort of the predominant multilateral organizations in the region. And naturally, none of this made the U.S. government happy. And there's um, a, a good deal of circumstantial evidence that suggests that they played a role in the violent crisis in Bolivia in 2008, when the wealthy provinces of the eastern Media Luna um, Half Crescent region tried to create, you know, a politically autonomous zone. Um, you had over 30 people killed killed um, by far-right militia groups. Uh, those groups, of course, played a role again in the coup in 2019. Mm. Um, and for uh, a while, for a short moment, uh, it looked like the central government um, of Evo Morales was losing control of the situation and that civil war, a coup would occur. The US had very close relations with the opposition groups that were in power in this half crescent region and um, you know, supported them a great deal through USAID and so on. The US ambassador himself met with a key leader of the separatist movement in the midst of this crisis. Um, and he was kicked out of the country. Um, the next day, Venezuela's President Chavez did the same uh, out of solidarity. And publicly, the US was um, you know, dismissive of the idea that a coup was in the works. But what's interesting is that when you look at um, leaked WikiLeaks cables, um, from the U.S. You see that the, the embassy was in fact developing contingency plans in the event of a coup attempt or Evo's assassination. So they were in fact internally taking that very seriously. Um, but publicly they were behaving as if nothing was amiss. Uh, I'm, going and meanwhile, to, I'm going to ask you to wrap your remarks up now if I can. Alex, thank you. Okay, Just, okay. Yeah. then I'll, I'll fast forward very quickly um, to where we are now. The, the coup itself was discussed and um, the elections, as was mentioned, we did a lot of work on the false claims that were made uh, by the OAS. Um, now the mass, of course, is back, um, um, thanks to the massive win in last uh, year's elections. Um, Bolivia is reasserting its sovereignty and independence. Uh, it's restored relations with Venezuela, Cuba, and Iran uh, after um, you know, the Añez uh, coup government broke with those uh, countries. Mm -hmm. And we have a new administration in the US. Um, there was hope that US uh, Latin America policy might improve a little, um, but you know, it was already a bad sign when the Biden campaign said nothing when the coup occurred, unlike his primary channel challenger, Bernie Sanders. And of course the first statement was mentioned by Ali from the secretary of state Blinken is promoting impunity for those responsible for the coup and, and the massacres and the repression that took place under the coup. Um, and so, you know, it's starting out under very bad auspices with the Biden administration. And so really just to conclude, um, what we've seen the US government do in Bolivia, uh, systematically undermining the left, trying to achieve regime change when the left is in power, is what the US has done all over Latin America. It's historically been doing that for over a hundred years. The methods have changed over time. Um, more sort of soft power and covert methods today than you know, the direct military intervention of not long ago. But the objectives are still the same, which is maintaining US hegemony in the US's backyard and preventing movements in favor of real independence uh, from the US from taking power. And when they do, from staying in power. So the good news is that organized social movements are winning the battle as we've seen in Bolivia. But U.S. methods are always evolving and rely increasingly on proxies like the Organization of American States and right-wing governments in the region like Colombia, mm -hmm. uh, which has been interfering in Ecuador in their elections. Mm -hmm. 
And this is why international solidarity is really more necessary than ever, including uh, great events like this one. Thank you very much. Alex, thank you. Thank you so much. That was uh, really good to hear from you. And I hope everybody's been following in the chat that you can look and see what the uh, CPR is, is doing. Um, I'm just going to tell you that we have over 500 people on this call from Huddersfield, Berry, Woking, Leeds, Colchester, Devon, uh, London, Wales, Canada, uh, in Paris, Dublin, and in the States, as well as having, uh, as well as hearing from Alex in Arizona, we've got people from Portland, from Michigan. We've obviously got people from La Paz, which we, whom we're delighted to have with us, from Bulgaria, from Geneva, and from Stockholm. So uh, all you internationalists are extremely welcome. Uh, and now we uh, we just have a little two minutes um, uh, plug for the uh, Labour Friends of, Pro of Progressive Latin America, so that if you don't know what it is that we do, you're going to find out now. Susan Gray, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Yeah, I'm Sue Gray. I'm one of the organisers of Friends of Bolivia and uh, tonight's important celebration. Um, now, in normal times, this is where several of us will be going around with buckets for the, the collection, but unfortunately we can't do that. Um, but we still do want to appeal to you for a donation if, if possible. It does take quite a lot of work from volunteers to host, host events like these, and we need your help really to help us cover the costs. And that includes things like hosting the Zoom webinar, sending emails to our list of supporters, all the donations are really, really helpful. I know that for some people, the pandemic has been very difficult financially, whereas other, other people have managed to save a bit of money. For, so if you're one of the luckier ones, and if you can manage to donate some money, then we would be very, very grateful. If you're able to donate, say, £10 or whatever you feel you can give, um, then please do so. Uh, using the link that's provided in the in the chat. I think the volunteers have, have posted the, the link in the chat. And with your continued support, we can carry on building international solidarity with Bolivia. Thanks very much. Sue, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, we we really miss being able to shake those buckets in meetings, but make sure that you find a different way of making sure that some of the spare cash, should you have any, comes the way of uh, Friends of Bolivia and uh, Labour Friends of Progressive uh, Latin America, because I'm sure you'll agree that these types of events are really important for international solidarity. So uh, our next speaker, our penultimate speaker, is Claudia Tuberg de Four. She is speaking from Wipalas Across the World, a collective of left-wing organisations, groups and individuals who support the process of change uh, in Bolivia, they fight for education, for justice, and respect for all Bolivians, including, of course, uh, indigenous multi-ethnic communities. Claudia, we're very pleased to have you with us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who's joining us today. Hallaya Bolivia. Hallaya, our brothers and sisters of the world, and Hallaya, our plurinational state of Bolivia. Um, can you hear me? Can I just check if you yeah, can? Yeah. Okay, yeah, perfect. good. Um, tonight, our collective and I are thrilled to be sharing this platform with comrades and leaders that have truly made a commitment to end the killings of Bolivian people during the coup d'etat. Between November 2019 and October 2020, Janine Oñez, a politician with a long history of racist and separatist values in the name of Christianity and with a wielding Bible, unleashed a racist wave of repression which resulted in the killings of our brothers and sisters in the massacre of Sacaba, Tencata, Pedregal, in the Zona Sur. In fact, she led a de facto regime that systematically targeted indigenous people. Her minister government, Arturo Murillo, now a fugitive from justice, organized and mobilized gangs and well-trained paramilitary, paramilitary facts that went on to the rampage and beat up, spat on, lynched and killed indigenous people the brutalized indigenous, indigenous people in a systematic uh, manner. My hope for tonight is that you live inspired by the strength of the Bolivian people and it's summa camaño, which is be living well, vivir bien, not living better, because living better will mean that someone will have to live worse off. I also hope that you live committed to continue to put Bolivia in your agenda 
to use all of the networks within your reach to ensure that never again, not in Bolivia, not in the region of Latin America and nowhere in the world, a coup d'etat takes place again. So yes, as a true movement, I'm bringing a little bit of homework for all of us as, as activists that we are. We Balance Across the World is an international um, collective that has gathered uh, tireless efforts and committed resistance to the violations of human rights during the de facto regime led by Yanine Oñez. Thanks to our combined grassroots experience in activism, trade unionism, and defense for human rights, we were enabled, he enabled us to join forces and build an international uh, solidarity uh, within the struggles for democracy in Bolivia. And in a context dominated by the crisis brought about by the pandemic and against the mainstream, <laughs> mainstream media silence of the voices of the victims of the coup, especially here in Europe. One activity we performed was to take 17 pages of victims' testimonies uh, and video evidence to the High Commission in Geneva as national and international neoliberal media uh, continue to deny a bloody coup was taking place in Bolivia. Janine Añez had shut down over 50 community radio stations across the country and further imprisoned journalists who resisted her regime. The persecuted media outlets that gave a voice to the Bolivian people like Casa Chuncoca news, to the point of even burning the promises. Agnes Restringim also paid 30,000 Bolivians, an equivalent of 14 months of uh, working class Bolivians a salary payment, uh, so that journalists could talk well of her regime. Far right, neoliberal capitalist driven media have and continue to misinform the public, most recently in Switzerland, where International Women's Day um, Molly, Fanny Molly from the Swiss radio and TV press uh, told the people, told the world that Bolivian women still needed to ask permission from their men uh, or their husbands to work. This is a form of misinformation about the Bolivian people and indigenous people, negating the advancement of our plurinational state, negating the advancement of the women's rights and their achievements. Thanks to the work of a determined collective in Geneva, the journalist has retracted uh, their statement. But this is only a small example of how racist and classist media uses colonial practices to stereotype and normalize the dehumanization of our peoples, especially native indigenous people in the international landscape, negating our process uh, of change, negating our growth, and ultimately negating the fact that we can govern our own nation. We as international collective are determined to challenge these colonial practices wherever they arise. And I think this is, it, this is the determination that became the key factor for overturning a US backed coup. Um, we, the Bolivian people, both in Bolivia and all over the world, do not want to see a regression of the process of change. The process of change, which is El Proceso de Cambio, a process that has brought a massive, massive change and the longest period of stability that our country has ever lived a process of change that has recognized 36 nations as equal under the new constitution of our country. Afro-Bolivians, Baure, Chiquitanos, uh, Guarayos, Quechuas, Yucarares, Guaranis, we are all under the same constitution and we're all existing and coexisting as equals peoples of our plurinational state of Bolivia. The process of change under then president uh, Evo Morales led on a revolutionary shift from deep-rooted neo-colonial practices to initiatives that put our natural resources, our mother earth, our Pachamama, and our people at the center of a reformation process, where our future process, uh, sorry, future prospects will no longer be based on the color of our skin, on our surnames, or the neighborhoods that we came from. Everyone became an equal citizen. Everyone obtained the right to access free healthcare and free education. Bolivia's poverty fell from 60% to 37%, and, in yearly, um, and it had a yearly economic growth of 4.5%. Indigenous women play a massive role in this. Their struggles sustainable and substantially influenced the constitution in the following areas. Equal access to education, health and work, gender equality between men and women, prohibition and punishment to any form of discrimination, prohibition and punishment to violence against women and children, and the right to participate in politics. 
because it is a requirement that 50% of parliament is women. But this change and successful economic, uh, economic model isn't good news for everyone. The far right and neoliberal practices were not happy with this success because of post fraud on their systems, on the millions that we're making out of our national resources. So these opposition forces through now, though they're now decreasing, they still have a lot of support and backing, especially from those countries that are interventionist countries that they come and in support to destabilize our democratically elected uh, president and vice president. Separated fascist groups in the east of Bolivia, for example, such as the Comité Pro Santa Cruz, Unión Juvenil Cruceñista, have created this Nación Camba, which is a fascist denomination that, according to them, distinguishes, distinguishes them as a better race, calling indigenous people salvajes, raza maldita, llamas, and so on. Their leaders, Rubén Costa, Branco Marinkovic, Luis Fernando Camacho, are some of the figures uh, alongside NGOs like Rios de Pie that have openly and proudly shaken hands with the US and Bolsonaro, for example, for either funding or strategic support for the fascist separatist groups in Bolivia. It is why, that's why people like Elon Musk publicly boasted about the liberty to fund the coup. As an international movement, we will continue to strive to foster education and decolonization of our minds and our bodies. So the process of change continues to be a driving force of Exuma Kamanga. Before I end, I want to dedicate this moment to the indigenous people that fought for our democracy to return. I want to dedicate this space to all the people that were killed, 37 people killed, 800 injured, and 1,500 imprisoned. We will always stand with you. And as a call of action to everyone that has listened to this uh, message to you all, I want you to remember to do two things. First, offer your international support and solidarity to the phenomenal agenda of our newly elected president, Luis Arce and David Toquehuanca. Already our country has seen humanity back in the streets of Bolivia and a bruised economy being reactivated again. Second, I want you to remember to support and bring visibility to the victims of the coup d'etat to remember that now there is a mural that you can bring visibility to and also a documentary that can be shared all over in your networks. Thank you for your time. Hayaya Bolivia, Hayaya or National State of Bolivia. Uh, Claudia, thank you so much. That was a, a brilliant presentation and it's really important you give people things to do at the end of a meeting. You, you said in your remarks that we should be inspired by the strength of the Bolivian people and we are certainly inspired by your remarks and we will continue to be inspired by the strength of the Bolivian people. Um, and we now come to our final speaker who of course needs no introduction, but I'm gonna give him a little introduction anyway, uh, who is himself obviously inspired uh, by the strength of the Bolivian people and who has been inspired across many years to provide solidarity in every possible form to uh, people in uh, to people in Latin America and people in struggle everywhere. Our last speaker is Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy, the floor is yours. Unmute, Jeremy. It is the word the word of the year. <laughs> unmute. Um, Could I say, Christine? Thank you very very much. And Claudia, I just heard what you said. Thank you very much indeed for what you said and the spirit with which you said it, because that is as important as anything else. I have a very real and very special affection for Bolivia. I first went there in um, 1969, when it was um, interesting but difficult. The military were ever present. Um, che Guevara was not long dead and um, it was, to me, fascinating, but also visiting small towns and villages where there was no Spanish spoken and uh, seeing the lives of people, but also the spirit with which they lived them and the way in which the colonial regime, which finished in the early 19th century, had not succeeded in destroying that culture uh, any more than it has now. And Simon Bolivar, always wanted Bolivia to be the country of real diversity and in his image of what Latin America could be about. 
And um, it's important to remember that, but also to recognize the wealth of Bolivia that was taken by the Spanish colonialists and by all the others, the business colonialists that came into Bolivia after independence in the early 19th century. And so it's in that past one has to recognize the great spirit that's there of the fight back of Bolivian people. The numbers of military coups have been the attacks on organized labor, the attacks on indigenous groups, the attacks on the living standards of the very poorest. At the same time, much of the world has made huge riches out of Bolivia. And so when the uh, uh, uprising happened in Cochabamba against the privatization of water led by Evo, uh, to me that was amazing and a turning point. And when you think that, I think I'm correct in saying that the water companies that were trying to take over Bolivian water got their original big leg up from the cheap privatization of water in Britain, which then became a byword for taking over public assets all around the world. And of course, from that grew the huge movement of the farmers and others, and eventually the election of Evo as president and mass as a formed into a political party. I then led a parliamentary delegation to Bolivia um, some years back. And um, Evo was not in the country at the time, but we met many, many other people whilst we were there. And I was particularly impressed with the work and the thought that gone into the development of the constitution, the numbers of women in the Bolivian parliament and the principles of the constitution where the um, commitment was that everyone would have right to housing, to health, to education, to employment, basically all the things from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights rolled into a constitution. To me, that was very, very impressive indeed. But of course, the wealthy and the powerful are not going to sit back and watch this happening any more than they did with Salvador Allende or any other country anywhere in the Americas that has sought to develop its own path for its own people. So we had the lawfare, we had the removal of Evo as president, and I think we also have to say a huge thank you to um, Andres Manuel, the president of Mexico, and the foreign minister of Mexico for the work that they did in ensuring that Evo was safe and able to leave Bolivia, go to Argentina, and then lead the fight back, albeit by conference call and Zoom, which is exactly what we're doing at the present time. And then when Mass won the election, I couldn't have been happier because they had shown that the people were not going to be fooled by this propaganda, not going to be fooled by this sort of stuff, and were going to live to fight another day as they've done. So I wish Bolivia well, of course. I wish the people of Bolivia well, and I wish them the strength to protect and enhance the environment, to protect the cultural diversity of Bolivia, and a huge participation by them in COP26 later this year. Because the global warming has a disproportionate effect on Bolivia, a disproportionate effect because of the uh, loss of water supply from the high Andes, and therefore the problems of agriculture in the future. And so I was impressed with what Bolivians were saying at the COP I went to in Paris in 2015, very impressed with their contribution. And I'm sure their contribution this time will be equally successful. I think they've set us all a fantastic example. So our job is to thank them for what they've taught us, but above all, to act in solidarity with the people of Bolivia. And so that the new demand of the world in a more sustainable world is, of course, for lithium. Bolivia has a lot of lithium. I'm sure it's going to be uh, used in a sensible and sustainable way, and it isn't going to be something that's ripped out of the country and taken into the hands of multinationals, as other uh, natural resources have been and are in other parts of the world. So it's our solidarity with Bolivia and the inspiration that it offers us. Christine is chairing today's event, and you'll see behind me, 
Peace and Justice. It's the project for peace and justice that uh, Christine is the chair of, and uh, I was the founder of it. And it is designed to promote international solidarity as well as solidarity with um, people in Britain that are struggling for economic security, struggling against the police bill, and struggling to um, deal with the issues of human rights abuse and in solidarity with refugees around the world. So we've many campaigns we're involved with, many people are working very well together to achieve that kind of change. International solidarity is absolutely at the heart of it. And my best regards and respects to all of the people of Bolivia, to the government of Bolivia, but above all to those that went through that terrible time when the legal coup took place Evo was removed and it looked as though things were going into a very dark period. Well, I think we've come out now into a brighter, better time and a brighter, better day. And my congratulations for all those achievements. Christine, thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias a todos y mi solidaridad para todo el pueblo boliviano. That's great, Jeremy. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And uh, brilliant timing too. Uh, we've come to the end of our time available. We've had brilliant speakers this evening. We've had contributions of all different types. We hope that there will also be some financial contributions from those of us who've been joining us, from those of you who've been joining us on the call through our various channels. It's clear that having an international meeting when you're actually talking about congratulating people and you're talking about the success and you're talking about, um, you're talking about celebration, it's not something that happens often enough but it clearly is happening uh, tonight in terms of everything that's going on in Bolivia so thank you very much to all of our speakers thank you very much on their behalf to all of you who joined uh, to listen to them thank you to all of you who've managed to make contributions and thank you in advance for any of you who make some more please do look out for um, other meetings about Latin America but also look out for uh, other parts of the uh, Arise uh, festival and I just close with solidaridad a todos y a todas. Muchas gracias. Oh,